Well, good morning and welcome. We are still letting a couple other folks join um, and we're going to go ahead and get started in just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and pull up my screen. All right. Good morning, everybody. My name is Lori DiLorenzo, and I'm going to be serving as the facilitator for the business meeting for the Office of Program and Support. We're really excited to see everybody here today, and unfortunately not able to join you in person, but at least virtually, and we can see everybody in the room. The business meeting is going to run from 11 to 1 o'clock today, and what we hope to accomplish during this time is an opportunity to explore the goal and priorities of OPS, and how it relates to HHS, HRSA, and to explore the HAP priorities, including the ending the HIV epidemic. We're also going to discuss how OPS coordinates activities across HRSA HAB and with other HRSA bureaus and offices and federal partner agencies. And we're going to explore in the second part of the session today how the AETCs and SPINs can work together to broaden the uptake of our evidence-informed interventions. So we have a shortened time today from 11 to 1 o'clock, and we're going to spend the first 45 minutes talking through OPS's overview and the current priorities. And then we're going to invite the SPINs grantees, the recipients, into the, um, our session, and we're going to talk about the AETC and SPIN spotlight on collaboration. We will wrap up by 1 o'clock so that we can get ready for the opening session of the Ryan White Conference. As you have questions throughout the day, feel free to use the chat room. We'll be monitoring that, and we'll be bringing it up at times when we can field the questions. At this point, what I'd like to do is to introduce our two speakers for this morning's session. First, it's my pleasure to introduce Captain Janine Willis-Marsh. She is the Director of the Office of Program Support, or OPS, in the HIV AIDS Bureau the Health Resources and Service Administration, or HRSA. Prior to joining HAB in 2017, Captain Willis Marsh led the division of the National Health Service Corps in HRSA's Bureau of Health Workforce. Trained as a podiatrist, Captain Willis Marsh has an extensive history working in public health, including working with HRSA's Office of Minority Health and serving as the Chief Professional Officer to advise the Office of the Surgeon General and DHHS on issues related to recruitment, retention, and professional development for health services officers. Our second presenter, Mrs. April Stubbs-Smith, currently serves as the Senior Public Health Advisor in the Office of Program Support. In this role, she is responsible for public health strategic planning, technical advisement to HABS OPS leadership, and external programmatic engagement and coordination for the Bureau as a whole. Prior to this role, Mrs. Stubbs-Smith served as the Director of HABS Division of Domestic HIV Programs in the Office of Training and Capacity Development, what we used to call OTCD. In this capacity, she's, served senior, she's provided senior management oversight of the Ryan White AIDS Education and Training Centers Program, Special Projects of National Significance, or SPINs, and the Hepatitis C Virus Program Activities within the Bureau. Mrs. Stubbs-Smith has worked extensively in both the public and private sector, including work with HRSA's Bureau of Primary Health Care, the FDA, and other programs related to HIV prevention and treatment, faith-based initiatives, and veteran healthcare access. At this point, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to Captain Willis Marsh to walk us through the presentation. Okay. If you could go ahead. Great. All right. Thank you. thank you so much, Lori. Good morning, everyone. And Lori, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, and it's good to see everyone virtually. Uh, so today is a, is a couple of firsts. So this is my first business day, my first virtual conference, uh, but actually it's my second Ryan White conference. And so it's still a very novel experience for me 
Um, and I, I wish we could see everybody, each other in person. Uh, but April and I would like to thank the team, Sherilyn and Lori uh, DiLorenzo for spearheading this joint effort uh, with the SPINS team, this joint business day. So, and we really appreciate the work that they've done to ensure that we have a really productive and dynamic morning. Um, the team has done a great job, and I don't know if you've had a chance to kind of tool around a little bit on the platform, uh, but they, they've done a fantastic job. So even though we're virtual, I know we're gonna have an amazing four days. So Lori is gonna drive the slides for me. So Lori, next slide, please. I am trying, but at the <laughs> moment, there we go. <laughs> okay, so there's actually two slides in here, two or three slides that we had to include, um, but I'm sure everybody knows about HRSA and uh, some of the programs uh, that we have, um, as well as about the people that, that we serve. Uh, so I won't go into detail on this slide. Next slide, Lori, please. Okay. And of course, we have uh, HAB's vision and mission statement. Um, next slide. Okay, you can stay. No, you can go back to the other one, Lori, the next one. Thank you. Uh, uh, going forward. Sorry All about right, that. so. <laughs> and one is, more. Is this, and one more. Uh, no? the, okay. The way. <laughs> let's, let's try this again. We have that one. Would you like to stay on the vision? Uh, I, I think everybody read it. One I more. Yes. Okay. Thank you. How's that uh, one? Okay. And, and this is just an overview slide that I'm sure you all have seen in multiple presentations uh, about the Ryan White program. Next slide, please, Lori. Okay. So, um, I believe I have met, at least virtually, just about everybody on the, on the, the in, that's here in the meeting today during the call that uh, we had in June. Um, and if you recall during that conversation, we talked a, a little bit about the reorganization and have. So some of this may be a repeat, uh, but we've been pretty busy since June 7th. So I have a little bit more to share. Um, as you can, next slide, please. So as you can imagine, uh, organizational change can be difficult for a variety of reasons. Uh, but I have to say that I could not be happier and I feel very, very blessed that the realignment has allowed us to expand our team in the Office of Program Support uh, to include April and Cheryl Lynn, Madia, Tari, Anna, Taria, and Deborah Lee, who is one of our new Pathways interns. And so they have been absolutely incredible during this process. And the team has done a fantastic job of making sure that there's minimal disruption uh, to the program, as well as taking a lot of time to orient me, as well as providing their expertise already to other initiatives and activities that we have going on in OPS. So if you recall too from the conversation, the goal of the program, um, I'm sorry, the goal of the reorganization uh, was to realign programs and function specifically around training and technical assistance um, to maximize the Bureau's response to ending the epidemic initiative. So in the reorg, the Office of Training Capacity and Development uh, was sunsetted and the three programs that were managed in the office were transferred to other divisions and offices in HAB. Um, and in the case of the PEPFAR or the global program to another part of HRSA. So the global program now resides in HRSA's Office of Global Health. And that uh, office is led by Dr. Austin Demby, who is a founding member of the CDC's Global AIDS program and is actually considered uh, the grandfather of the PEPFAR program, not that he's old, uh, but he has made significant contributions over the years to, uh, to uh, global HIV AIDS. So the SPINS program or Special Projects of National Significance is now managed um, in our division of policy and data um, where Antigone Dempsey is the division director. Many of you probably know her 
um, or have seen her participate uh, in plenaries and in other uh, conferences. And you're gonna see her today during, uh, not today, I'm sorry, during one of the plenaries during this uh, week session. Um, and so the AETC program and staff are now a part of the Office of Program Support. And I was actually really thrilled when April agreed to serve as our trusted senior advisor. Um, and Cheryl Lynn is our senior lead public health analyst and is managing several important operational um, functions for the program. Uh, so it's, it's due to them and the efforts of the team uh, that we have really been able to continue moving forward. Um, and you're gonna hear a little bit more about that uh, during today. So just to give you a little bit of background about the Office of Program Support, I know it may be a little bit in the weeds, but I think it will help to provide context around the value the workforce team um, is, has brought to OPS. So the office, um, as Lori stated in my bio, was officially launched in January of 2017 um, when I left the National Health Service Corps and came to have um, to stand up the office. And at that time, there were eight staff members, including myself. So I, we were what I considered to be a small but mighty office. So the purpose uh, or the reason why the office was established was to manage um, several key business processes critical for organizational operations. So OPS is responsible for the Bureau's IT investments and portfolio management, um, our internal and external uh, communications, organizational development and training, uh, grants management. We, at any given year, have about 23 to 25 uh, grant programs that are in process some way, shape, or form. Um, and now, of course, we have workforce training and development. So on this slide, though, you'll see that um, the workforce team is listed as a branch. Uh, this was from a very earlier in, in version of um, from the packet that went forward to, to be approved. But we're actually not organized uh, into, into branches in OPS. We're organized by teams. And so, uh, and again, the, the analysts that you know, Monty and Tree and Anna, so on, are, are now our HIV workforce training and development team. So, and we're also pleased to announce that that team has grown since June. Uh, and we now have Suzanne Abo, who I believe is on the, uh, has joined us today, um, has joined that team and we're expecting our new medical officer to join us in September. So the Office of Program Support has actually grown by leaps and bounds over the past couple of weeks. So we're now up to 18 members and we're still growing and, and onboarding folks. So the merger, so to speak, has allowed us to expand our platform and to work and to further integrate the work that we do with programs, uh, with program, uh, because uh, a, a lot of the, the, all the work that we do is on behalf of the, the Bureau, but we've only been tangentially involved uh, with, with actual program. Um, so this is a, a, just a, a, a wonderful boost for the office. So in, in addition to our wonderful new team members, um, we've been able to enhance our current work portfolio and capitalize on the knowledge of the workforce team, their knowledge and experience in public health to inform what we do and, and how we do it. Um, so as far as the AECTC program is concerned, like I said, we've hit the ground running and we've been able to establish a few priority areas that I wanna share with you today. So as you already know, there's a lot of work going on uh, regarding ending the epidemic. And our goal is to ensure that the AETCs continue to be an invaluable resource um, for multiple stakeholders. So in conversations with the team, we recognize that there's an opportunity for us to increase the knowledge and visibility of the, uh, of the AETC program among our colleagues 
and have, as well as with our other federal partners, both in HRSA and outside of HRSA. And so to accomplish this, we are at the very beginnings of developing a, a branding and communication plan that will initially target uh, the leadership in HAB, as well as our project officers um, and other bureaus and offices within HRSA. In order for us to do this though, we're definitely going to need your, your help and guidance. And so, like I said, we're at the very beginnings of developing the framework for the plan and we will be meeting with you um, to solicit your, your input and guidance. Um, so one of the things that we have been doing already, we've already started having individual um, conversations uh, with the, the AETCs. And our goal is to meet with everyone, at least to have one round done by the end of October. So if you haven't already received an invitation yet, um, just hold on, because we're, we're coming, we're coming. Um, we had a really, really good conversation with um, Angie and John uh, about partnering with the NCRC with regards to workforce development, because quite frankly, it's an area, uh, with the exception of, of the work going on with, within the AETC program, HAB is just starting to focus on workforce development. Um, and so we're very much looking forward to those continued conversations, as well as, uh, like I said, um, how we can really develop synergy between the work that is being done by the AETCs and the work that we'll be doing um, in HAB uh, to really uh, move forward with this, uh, with this initiative and bringing to bear all that we can to, to help make this a success um, and to support the efforts of the NCRC uh, and the other AETCs. So uh, another thing that we've been working on is a virtual site visit protocol that we are looking to launch no later than ja uh, January. Um, and in addition, we're already starting to think about uh, the AETC competitions in FY2000 uh, 22. So 2022. So these are uh, just a few things that we are working on. Uh, and we're really very much looking forward to the new and exciting opportunities that the initiative um, has brought to have into the program. Uh, and I just wanted to, again, thank the team, um, as well as thank each and every one of you for the warm welcome that you extended to me uh, uh, when the AETC program came to OPS. I really appreciate it. Uh, I've been very, very enthusiastic and excited about the conversations that we've had. Uh, and uh, just in conversations with the team, like I said, we're very much looking forward to what we can do to, to help the program be a success, as well as to support you in your, your efforts. Uh, so thank you so much. I am going to stop here and ask April to talk about uh, some of the departmental and agency-wide uh, priorities. April? Thanks, Janine, and good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone this morning, and I hope everyone continues to do well. Lori, um, next slide. Okay, we'll talk about uh, the AETC program's role in ending the HIV epidemic. Next slide. So I'm just gonna quickly go through the four pillars of EHE. I know many of you are familiar with it and some of our newer staff um, and newer team members uh, who, who joined the program on, on your end and the recipient end may not be. Um, so EHE, the goal is to reduce HIV infections by 75% in five years and a 90% reduction in 10 years. So it's a very lofty goal, but we know it's doable. Um, because we have the, the tools that we need to make this happen. And the EAG framework has been broken into four pillars, diagnose, treat, prevent, and respond. 
And all of the HHS, HHS operating divisions, our partners at CDC, uh, FDA, um, uh, IHS, uh, all of our partner agencies have some involvement uh, in EHE, and particularly with HRSA, the HIV AIDS Bureau, and our partners in the Bureau of Health, um, the Health Center Program in the Bureau of Primary Health Care. So these are the four pillars and what each agency has been tasked with, each OPDIV has been tasked to take the lead on certain aspects of each pillar and also work together to make sure that we meet these goals as outlined in the uh, framework, the plan for America. Next slide. So, oh, we're not from pillar two. Um, can you go back one, Lori? went from pillar one to pillar two. Okay, I think that one might have gotten accidentally deleted. But uh, pillar one is, is diagnosed really that all people with HIV are diagnosed as early as possible and in uh, exceptional amount of increased testing across the board. So next slide will take us, I think, into pillar two. So pillar two is really the, the meat of the, the Ryan White program and our activities around HIV care and treatment. Um, with the goal being that people with HIV will take their medication as prescribed to keep them at an undetectable level um, and effectively pose no risk of sexually transmitting the virus to their partners. And HRSA's focus is linking people with HIV who are either newly diagnosed, uh, making sure that they enter into care, um, those who are diagnosed but not into care, or who may have dropped out of care, making sure that they have the support services and other ancillary supports to get into care and maintain their treatment with the goal of becoming um, virally suppressed and supporting services to reach uh, the undetectable viral to support them as they continue to uh, improve their health. And to do this, the HIV AIDS Bureau specifically is encouraging initiation of rapid HIV care and treatment to achieve viral suppression to stop transmission. And over the course of this week in the agenda for the conference, there are several um, really exciting presentations by many of our recipients who are already doing rapid um, test and treat on the ground. So I encourage you to uh, um, make time for those two for your availability with this very, very busy schedule. Um, secondly, TAB is really focusing on increasing capacity uh, by funding the Ryan White Part A program, uh, which is the, the um, uh, the states and the health departments and the EMAs, and then part B focusing on the, the states as well in the identified jurisdictions of EHE. So our uh, eligible metropolitan areas, EMAs, and our uh, transitional grant areas, the TGAs, are managed by our part A program and um, Part B program is managed by our Division of State HIV AIDS programs, and they work very closely together. I know for the AATC program recipients, we um, recently had a call with the EHE um, recipient winners for the um, systems coordination provider, the SCIP, as well as the technical assistance provider, the TAP. Um, so we will continue to work with those recipients, as well as OPS and the AATC program working really closely with Part A and Part B. Um, thirdly, we'll provide workforce capacity development through the Part F AATC program, um, which you all have been doing an exceptional job, particularly with this current environment with COVID-19, um, really increasing your amount of trainings and keeping them virtual and just being there for all the recipients is very appreciated. And we've been hearing a lot of wonderful feedback from the recipients appreciating that you have been able to keep your level of activities up and running to support them. And how we'll continue to provide TA uh, across all of the jurisdictions through our various uh, cooperative agreement programs. Next slide. Pillar three is the prevention of HIV infections. Um, all of the optives have some activity involved with that. Um, uh, it's primarily our partners at the Centers for Disease Control. But pillar two, pillar three, uh, prevention will focus on increasing access to HIV prevention interventions, including uh, PrEP and post-exposure prophylaxis, uh, syringe service syringe service program, SSPs, and HIV prevention education, which we know um, the AATCs, you all recipients are very much involved in, and we thank you for that continued support. So there is a lot of uh, cross coverage of the activities, and we 
work very closely with our CDC partners to share information. Um, we have uh, a multiple uh, range of ways we stay in contact with each other to make sure that we are checking in with each other to find out what are the needs, what are some best practices that many of the EHE recipients on both sides are starting to see and keeping those lines of communication open so we can share that information with you. And for the health center program, many HRSA funded health centers, we call them our um, dually funded uh, health centers, they provide HIV prevention services, including PrEP. Um, at 1.2 Americans, we know are at high risk for HIV infection and would benefit from PrEP. So I'm sure um, in, in a lot of the media, and if you are following the, the newsletters and the updates from HIV.gov, you'll see that the Ready, Set, PrEP program um, continues to be a major focus of HHS Office of Infectious Disease Policy and providing PrEP through our Ryan White recipients, as well as the PrEP training that you, our AATC recipients, provide. Everyone is working together to really, really make sure that PrEP gets into the hands of those who most need it and who have the less access. Next slide. HRSA will focus on the key geographic areas of, of the EHE to expand uh, PrEP to health center patients who are at highest risk. I just spoke about that. And then we will also, as I said earlier, really focus on supporting you um, our AETC program recipients to increase workforce capacity training and clinical consultation uh, for providers directly uh, via not only our, the, the hotlines available through our National Clinician Consultation Center, but also the direct uh, work that you do working through your partners in your regions and states. Next slide. So I'm going to shift briefly to our CARES Act funding. And we know that um, the, the funding that was received and released to all of our recipients has definitely played a crucial role into supporting not only the ATC program recipients, but also all of our Ryan White uh, recipients to be able to continue to do the services um, under these significant um, unexpected conditions. Next slide. So as you know, uh, President Trump on March 27th of this year signed into law the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, which is the CARES Act, which authorized $90 million in this fiscal year to provide a one-time award for the Ryan White HIV AIDS program and all of its recipients to prepare, prevent, and respond to the COVID-19 pandemic directly through various mechanisms. Next slide. The purpose of the CARES Act funding is to promote uh, individual and community-wide prevention practices and administer countermeasures to reduce the impact of COVID-19 and the risk for people with living with HIV, prepare and enhance your readiness for training, services to respond to COVID-19 for people with HIV, and respond directly by assessing, testing, diagnosing, and limiting the spread of COVID-19 uh, for people living with HIV who the Ryan White program serves. But we also know that the CARES Act funding that was provided to the Ryan White recipients also helped them continue to support their own internal staff. We know that COVID-19 has affected many of your staff personally, uh, whether they have tested positive and are recovering or supporting family members and other loved ones, as well as supporting your colleagues. So thank you for the continued hard work that you do. And we have been receiving all of your comments, uh, appreciating the work, but we know it's definitely a heavy lift. Next slide. So this is just a brief summary slide of the HAB awardees uh, who received a COVID award. You see our Part A uh, received the Emergency HIV Relief Grants to 52 of the Part A recipients. Uh, Part B uh, states went out to uh, the 55 uh, recipients um, and also some additional support for our AIDS Drug Assistance Program, our ADAP uh, Cooperative Agreement. Part C, uh, early intervention services, a large, large share of our Part C recipients receive CARE Act uh, funds. And then our Part D, Women, Infant and Children and Youth Program, which is also managed through our Part C uh, program. They received uh, 115 recipients received funding. 
Um, and then of course, you are AATC recipients, uh, Receive Care Act, of course, the regional AATCs, the NCCC, our national, um, the NCRC, uh, National Coordinating Resource Center, and our HIV, national HIV curriculum uh, uh, recipient partners. Next slide. And we are at the end of the slide, wow. Um, so I think uh, now is the time where I will turn it over to Lori and Taria to uh, start going through the chat. And Janine and I are available to answer any questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, both April and Captain Willis Smith. This is great to have an opportunity to just dialogue with the folks here. Um, if I can ask our tech support to go ahead and pull the slides down, we're going to go ahead and um, field questions. So feel free to pose them in the chat room. Um, and we're going to start there because I know that we have the first question came in um, from, from Helene Bednarsh, who was asking, are any funding going to oral health services? And it was specifically posed when we were talking about the CAREX funding. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Laura. Let me go off mute. So I do know that um, oral services, um, there's a portion of services that are provided through our Part C program. Um, I don't know specifically how much or what the percentage of it was that it's going to oral care services, but there are some of um, some of the services provided through the Bureau of Primary Health Care through the Health Center program and their CARE Act funding. Um, I think they did receive some support for oral health care services. Great, thanks April. What other questions you guys have? <coughs> Feel free to put them in the chat room, or if you want to take yourself off mute and just pose the question as well, you can do that. Um, and while we're waiting, it looks as if um, Nicolay uh, has gone ahead from the Target HIV Center, uh, posted some information that uh, um, a national coordinating center has restarted the collaboration with our FTCs. Um, that dates back many years when we had initiatives with that, so it's wonderful to see we're um, starting that again and continuing it. So what are the questions? You've all been muted, so if you want to ask a question, go ahead and take yourself off mute and you can raise it or put it into the chat room. Any questions about the reorg or what's happening with the end of the uh, ending the HIV epidemic? You guys aren't typically a quiet group. What's <laughs> happening? <laughs> You're just getting used to technology, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. So um, a question was actually, can we put the reorg chart up again? So I will go ahead and I'll pull that up. Make sure I've got the right one. And Preston, do you have a specific question? that you would like to ask with that? I think it was Preston. It was uh, Prescott, yeah. From the Prescott, okay. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I just wanted to see where all the pieces were. And, and Janine, thank you for your discussion earlier. Um, uh, you're would be nice you're welcome. There, it would be nice if there was a, if there was another or a new chart that, um, delineates the other teams that you had mentioned within your office. I know sure. specifically for today, you know, we're, we're uh, within that yellow group, but uh, it would just be nice to see the, the rest of who compromise or who composes your team. Okay. All right. We can send that out. Not through the conference. We'll send it out through the distribution list. Thanks Prescott. And, and I guess a follow-up question, just in terms of the reorg, um, mm -hmm. I, I guess for me, the biggest question is, you know, the separation of SPINs and AETCs um, as being both part of Part F. Um, I've always seen it as, as um, you know, not conjoined twins, but, but part of the same program that mm -hmm. 
And so it seems a little odd that they're separated. Can you talk a little bit more? I guess you did discuss the, the rationale behind it, but what are mm -hmm. ways in which we're going to make sure that um, both SPINs and AETCs continue to, to work together or, or work better together uh, now that we're in different divisions, it seems like it's a, a harder ask. Okay. And so that's actually a really good question, um, Prescott. So I think uh, even today, the business day, which is, uh, we thought was invaluable that we continued uh, with the planning, having both the SPINs and the AETC um, programs coming together today. And so it's, it, one of the good things is that it has helped to highlight the importance, like you said, of the two programs staying connected. And so what it will mean, you know, while the program and the staff are, are in different divisions, uh, we're, we're really, well, when we go back to work, we're literally just down the hall from each other. And so it, it will take um, just a little bit more of a concerted effort on, on our part uh, to make sure that that we do stay aligned and we continue working together. And I will have to tell you, uh, from the very beginning, uh, when the reorganization was announced, uh, the leadership in DPD and OPS, uh, we all, and the staff, we all agreed that it was very, very important that we not lose sight of the progress that's been made, uh, be, you know, between the because of the partnership between the AETC and the SPINS program. So um, we are, are committed to, to ensuring that that work continues and that we continue to partner. Okay, thanks. And, and I assume we're gonna talk a little bit more when SPINS folks join us later. Yes. And, and Janine and Prescott, this is April. Just to add a little bit more context to that about your question on the separation. Um, so over the past, uh, several years, the HIV AIDS Bureau has been really intimately involved in expanding our implementation science framework um, for the, the demonstration projects moving forward. And, a, and the SPINS program um, is, is very uniquely situated to support that in working with our other implementation science partners. Uh, the Division of Policy and Data, they also do some of that current work. So I think at the time of, of the planning, it made sense to move those demonstration projects within SPINS um, and that implementation science activity as a part of that work. Um, but as, as Janine stated, and, and uh, Cheryl Lynn and Adon will, will talk in more detail um, for the next session, uh, it is absolutely expected of us, um, and we anticipate um, that the close collaboration between the SPINS program and the AETC program will continue to move forward. And in your support, uh, the AETC program support with in um, looking at the uptake of a lot of these interventions uh, will, will not change. Hopefully that's a little bit more. Yeah, thanks, April. That's great. Great. We have another question in the chat room, and it is specifically asking about Care Act funding. And it's asking whether or not, um, we know we already had the question about the oral um, care services. The other question is, do we anticipate an expansion of, e oh, sorry, um, EHE funds, not CARES Act. Do we anticipate an expansion of EHE um, funds to additional jurisdictions? Um, I, not at this time. Okay. Thanks, Janine. Other questions? Hi there. This is Andrea Norberg. And I wanted to, first of all, thank you for this overview. It's really helpful. And my question is directed to Dr. Willis Marsh. You mm -hmm. had mentioned that we would be, or that you're working on a branding plan and that, um, you're early on in its, um, in its development. The uh -huh. ATC NCRC is often very involved with branding and marketing, um, yes. specifically related to the AETC program. So I guess maybe could you talk to us, tell us a little more about um, the branding plan and if you anticipate sure. our involvement, that would be great. Yes, yes to both uh, questions. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that uh, we have done 
uh, like I said, as part of the, the ending the epidemic um, and thinking about what does that mean for the HIV AIDS Bureau. Um, and specifically now that the AETC program is in OPS, what does that mean for us? How can we make sure that the AETCs have, at least from, from, from our side, um, visibility and a seat at the table, so to speak, um, and to make sure that we're included in, in all conversations. And so in conversations with the, with the staff uh, and with others across the Bureau, what we identified was an opportunity for us to educate um, the, the staff uh, to basically a, another level, for them to have another level of detail around what exactly the AETCs do and what does that look like? Uh, because if they're able to explain it to our other stakeholders um, and to their grant recipients, and I'm really kind of, uh, uh, the focus, part of the focus is on our project officers, um, then we can ensure uh, or we hope that there will be an, an increase in the number of our recipients that are um, uh, seeking out uh, technical assistance and support from the AETC program. And so how we arrived at that really was through um, informal conversations that we've had with leadership um, in, the, in the Bureau as well as project officers uh, that are managing other parts of the program. So there's just, there's an opportunity to do a little bit more education um, and raising awareness and knowledge, um, not only internally to and have, uh, but also with some of our other um, federal partners um, within, uh, within HRSA, such as uh, the Bureau of Primary Healthcare, um, the uh, Office of Regional Operations, and um, the Office of Rural Health Policy in particular. And it's not to say there's already work that's being done, but you know, sometimes you, you assume people know things and they don't know what you think they know. Uh, and so that's what we're uncovering a little bit here. And now the time is like right, right now with the Ending the Epidemic initiative, we're onboarding a total of 30 new staff uh, in the Bureau. And so it's an opportunity for us to make sure that um, folks are, are, are very much aware and can provide examples and really explain um, all of the technical assistance and support that the, uh, the AETCs um, bring to bear. So uh, that's a, um, uh, something that I think is really important. And on the flip side of that, it's, it's also, at least from our perspective, how can we further support you all in your efforts? Um, you know, we, we, from a federal perspective, there's a lot that we can leverage uh, between our uh, partners, folks that we have worked with. Um, I'm a commissioned officer, so we have a whole cadre of officers that are also available. Um, I can't commit everybody, but I can commit a few. Uh, and so that's what we're really looking to do. Actually, I think John sent us some of your um, infographics and things like that, uh, that we expect to use and it's been very, very helpful. And so I just wanna reiterate though, uh, so specifically Andrea, what I've talked about um, for the NCRC helping us is around kind of that workforce development. We know you all have been doing work. It's really the time for us to get started and for us to partner to move those efforts uh, forward. So um, part of this whole planning and communication and branding, uh, like I said, we can't do it without you all. And so we've been scheduling individual meetings um, with each one of the AETCs that we will continue and we'll have conversations during the director's meeting as well. So uh, uh, I think we can do, uh, we have a lot planned, um, in our, at least in our heads. So we're looking forward to sharing with you what, what we think um, we need to do on this end and getting your guidance and input. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. And we are right at 1145. So as the SPINS recipients are coming into the field, we're going to field one last question that was posed by Naria from, Daria from um, Nika. And what she was uh, uh, posting in there is, I believe it was mentioned that OPS will be working on the ATC competitive guidance. The move to OPS hasn't affected the current length of the grant cycle, has it? That is that we are still in year two of a five-year cycle. So is that still um, the, the stage? Yes, no, nothing has changed. What we're thinking about, so for this year, we've already started kicking off the planning process for FY 2022 um, in the federal government. Uh, and in the in the bureau, so it's a lot of planning and work on our end and with the team to get prepared for FY 2022. So um, uh, that's the that's it's a heavy lift. So we've already started those planning efforts, but no, it won't change the current uh, project period or anything like that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for the questions that have been posed today. Um, at this point, knowing that we are at 1146, we're going to transition to the second part of our um, discussion for today. So we are going to actually continue the dialogue that Prescott was um, asking about in terms of this collaboration between SPINS and the AETC program. So what I'd like to do at this point is to, um, I'm going to go ahead are you guys seeing my slides? Um, let's see, I just want to make sure that we are up here. Having a little bit of technology problems with my computer screen at the moment. Well, let me introduce and then I'll have the tech folks go ahead and pull up the second slide sec. Um, so I'd like to at this point introduce our two um, speakers who are going to kick us off for this session and, for, um, and to welcome the SPINS recipients into um, the fold. For this, uh, between now until the uh, top of the hour of 1 o'clock, we're going to be exploring the SPINS AETC collaboration. Um, and so with that, I want to introduce the two speakers who are going to kick it off, and that is Adan Kahina and Sherilyn Crooks. Crooks. So Adan Kahina currently serves as the branch chief of the SPINS National SPINS Projects of National Significance, or the Special Projects of National Significance, or SPINS. It's a position that he's held since 2006. He's had 25 years of experience working in the HIV epidemic. Mr. Kahina holds a Master's of Science degree in Operations Research and Management Sciences, and a Bachelor of Science in Systems Analysis and Engineering from the George Washington Washington University. Cheryl Lynn Crooks will then follow, and she um, is a primary care physician assistant with over 20 years of experience and currently serves as a supervisory public health analyst within the Office of Program Support, or OPS. She's managed multiple training and technical assistance programs during her nine and a half year tenure at HRSA and is a member of OPS's HIV workforce training and development team. She currently provides oversight of the AIDS Education and Training Centers program. So at this point, Adan, I'm going to turn it over to you and Cheryl Lynn. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, uh, if not, let me know. <laughs> Uh, so again, my name is Adan Kahina. I'm branch chief of the Special Projects of National Significance um, SPINS, and I welcome to everybody uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to our virtual uh, National Run White Conference. Uh, good to be with you all. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. The previous one. I think we jumped one. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, so the Ryan White program, uh, um, I think it, uh, you have to go back to, uh, no, no. Yeah, I'm trying to get back the, uh, go ahead. one more. One before, one, yeah, good? there we go. That's, that should be the first one, yes. Uh, thank you, you know. This is just basically an overview uh, uh, about HERS supporting more than, uh, eight, more than 90 programs to more than 3,000 awardees uh, in all parts of the United States. Uh, by delivering uh, primary care to serve tens of millions of people, including people living with HIV and AIDS, and other vulnerable populations who otherwise uh, would be unable to access uh, quality healthcare. Next slide, please. Um, 
and here we and here we have the vision and mission uh, of the uh, of the HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau, which is uh, as a vision provide optimal HIV care and treatment for all, and as a mission to provide leadership and resources to uh, assure access to and retention in high quality integrated care and treatment services for vulnerable people with HIV and AIDS and their families. Next. Uh, a little bit about HRSA's RAN YHIV AIDS programs. Uh, as you may be familiar, um, uh, these programs provide comprehensive HIV care to more than half of people diagnosed with HIV in the United States. Approximately uh, 520,000 uh, people receiving care through Ryan White. Uh, out of these, 80% uh, were violence suppressed in 2018, exceeding the national average of 62.7%. Next slide, please. A little bit of what SPINS does. Um, uh, so the SPINS program uh, is a component of the Ryan White program. And for more than 20 years, it has supported the development of innovative models of HIV care, evaluates the effectiveness of these models, and promotes dissemination and replication of those models deemed to be successful. Among other activities uh, mandated by the Ryan White uh, legislature uh, on the SPINS program, is the support of special programs uh, to support the effective integration of data systems through our Ryan White recipients. Thank you, next. I think we are uh, at, at the slide, portfolio of SPINs, uh, portfolio of special programs of national significance. Um, um, so I'm, I'm having a little bit of problem with the slides themselves. Oh, One moment, I, please. Yeah, Just I, I, are you able to see that now? No, it's the easiest slide following um, uh, what SPINS does as a subtitle. Um, but if, if we're having technical difficulties, uh, I probably could go on and you know, just in case. Uh, very good. Thank we you. We can see it now, Lori. We can see it now. Thank you. We can see it now. Uh, basically, this slide here basically shows that SPINS manages a portfolio of 25 million uh, uh, grants and co-op agreements and contracts distributed across different initiatives, projects, etc. Uh, this year, we have a portfolio of about 46. That's of recipients. And for the project period, uh, which will be starting on September of this year, just in about a couple of weeks, three weeks, we will fund uh, 31 new projects in addition to contracts related to uh, evaluation of HIV services. Uh, next, please. Um, a little bit on SPINS innovative initiatives, just basically doing a quick overview. Um, this slide is showing a list of, uh, of, of our current and new initiatives. Um, and the new initiative is about to start in about a three weeks, including the provision of innovative services and evaluation to black men and sex men. Uh, we also have people living uh, uh, with HIV of housing and employment services. Um, uh, another initiative on developing effective systems of care for patients living with HIV and hepatitis C. And as well as promoting uh, initiatives that promote capacity building to organizations interested in adopting effective SPINS components or interventions. So next month, uh, we're starting a new initiative for black women living with HIV by promoting innovative strategies uh, to better engage and retain them in care. Also, uh, promoting innovation in rapid ART models of HIV care and continue to pilot test a more effective data to care approaches uh, through better integration of hepatitis C, uh, sexually transmitted infections and HIV surveillance systems. Next. Um, this is a, a, a map that, that basically uh, portrays uh, a distribution of SPINS recipients and sub recipients across the country uh, with the presence uh, in those geographical areas um, highly affected by the HIV epidemic, including those emerging areas, such as the Southeast section of the United States. Next. Now, uh, the following slides um, uh, will provide you with a sense of where the SPINS projects are when broken by uh, the eight AETC regions. 
And I will go very quickly through these slides, uh, but just want you to see that SPINS has addressed throughout their funded projects uh, in each of the eight ATC regions. Uh, next. And here we have the, uh, the New England ATC and, uh, and the uh, current SPINS projects that we have in that region. Next. Uh, Southeast ATC, a few more projects in this region. That's good. Next. Mid Atlantic ATC, quite a bit of projects as well. Next. The Northeastern and Caribbean ATC. Next. The South, South Central uh, AETC. Next, Pacific AETC. And last but not least, uh, in the next slide, we will see um, the Mountain West AETC. So basically, just to show you that uh, there is a presence, um, and I think that I missed the Midwest AETC, which is going to come right after this one, if I'm not mistaken. There we go, there we go. So we got the AETC regions all well covered uh, uh, by SPINS projects uh, and initiatives. Next slide, please. Um, so I just wanna here to highlight um, uh, basically where, uh, where to find some of the uh, uh, SPINS resources, you know, um, all right. Uh, first one is uh, the Hairs of Brian White HIVAIDS program, uh, which uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're very familiar. Uh, uh, you have gone there many, many times, uh, but basically gives you a portrait of, uh, of the current and past SPINS initiatives from the most recently funded to the other ones, you know, providing you with a general description of the goals and, ob and objectives of each of the initiatives being funded. Uh, then uh, you see the target HIV um, a link, uh, and that's where you will find a list of promising care models from the SPINS program. Uh, you will find uh, the Integrating HIV um, Innovative Practices, or IHIP, uh, which provides uh, resources such as uh, implementation packages and toolkits from uh, uh, a variety of SPINs evaluated uh, initiatives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and over here, just basically to show you um, a screenshot of, uh, of, of, of one uh, uh, on the left-hand side cover of, uh, of an implementation manual on how to move patients along the HIV care continuum. Then uh, we're also showing you a snapshot of individuals of individual case studies that we promote, uh, offering replication tips uh, on this particular case on hepatitis C treatment, as well as uh, um, on the right hand side, you will see a pocket guide uh, highlighting uh, linkages to uh, to care interventions from uh, jail settings to the community, and how to implement care coordination activities, uh, uh, all evaluated through screens. Next, and. Uh, and basically, this is just basically um, uh, to highlight uh, the great work of the uh, dissemination of various informed interventions uh, that we call the day. Uh, these uh, day uh, interventions are sponsored by Ace United in collaboration with the Boston University uh, 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 evaluation team, and they have put together uh, two new uh, two new implementation manuals. You know that will that are currently residing uh, on the target center. One has to do with peer linkages. Uh, and, and these are for women of color living with HIV and, and AIDS. Uh, one on peer linkages and the other one on enhanced patient navigations. Again, all of these uh, are currently living or will be living very shortly on the target HIV as soon as we get clearance in, uh, in more than, no more than two weeks. So with, with that, now I will hand it over to my colleague, uh, Sherilyn Crooks, who is the branch chief of the, uh, or, or it's, uh, it's uh, now uh, it's a senior leader in the AETC program. Thank you. Sherilyn, all yours. Thank you, Adon. Um, great overview. And similar to how Adon provided an overview of the SPINS program, I'll provide an overview of the AETC program. And just um, as I um, go over the components, just keep in mind and continue to consider how the AETC program can um, continue to move forward a lot of the initiatives that Adan went over, um, which has already started. That work really has already started. Next slide. So going over the mission of the AATC program, essentially is to increase the number of healthcare providers who are able to um, counsel, diagnose, treat, and medically manage people with HIV. 
as well as to help prevent high-risk behaviors that lead to HIV transmission. Next slide. So this slide basically um, supports the mission um, that was just provided for the AATC program, um, provides our legislation as well as annual appropriation of $33 million. Um, the AATC program is, um, consists of leading HIV experts um, with local providers that provide that essential training that's needed within the community. In addition to that, um, the AATC program um, trains and provides technical assistance for healthcare professionals, interprofessional health teams, and healthcare organizations um, to be able to prevent, diagnose, and treat HIV disease. And there's a special emphasis on clinicians who are minority racial ethnic background or, or are serving um, minority populations. And this includes our Native Americans and Alaska Natives. Next slide. So the ATC program goals um, for the past, over the past 30 years has um, included to increase the size and strengthen the skills of the HIV clinical workforce. Um, in addition to that, um, improve outcomes along the HIV care continuum and reduce HIV incidence. And this is by achieving and maintaining viral suppression in people with HIV. Next slide. So this slide provides an overview of um, all of the components and programs under the AATC umbrella. And this includes our regional AATC program, um, the two national AATCs, a National Coordinating Resource Center and the National Clinician Consultation Center. In addition to that, um, we have the national evaluation contractor that provides evaluation of the entire AATC program. And then we have a suite of um, national HIV curriculum programs um, that work together. Next slide. Now this slide provides um, an overview of where each of the regional AATCs are located throughout the United States. And this map actually can be found on the National Coordinating Resource Center website, uh, websites listed here, and it's very valuable. In addition to this uh, map that's um, located here, the website also provides um, an overview of where you can find the regional partner sites for each regional AATC. Next slide. So within the regional AATC program, I'm going to focus on core training as well as practice transformation, as these two components really have specific um, programmatic requirements um, for coordinating with SPINS program and promoting and um, disseminating SPINS initiatives. Say hello to you. Next slide. So for our core training um, program, it actually focuses on reaching novice and low volume H, uh, HIV providers, um, as well as within clinics. And for novice providers, those are providers that have less than six years of HIV experience. Um, and for low volume providers, those who have less than 10 patients um, with HIV on their panel per year. Um, core training also includes implementing replicable HIV service delivery models and evidence-based interventions. And this includes um, collaboration with our SPINS colleagues, um, um, promoting those SPINS models as um, the AATCs are conducting trainings, as well as coordinating with our Parts A and B recipients um, in order to ensure that the core training work plan is focused on areas um, of great need um, where the ATCs can intervene. Next slide. Practice transformation um, currently is a minimum of 40% of the ATC budget. Um, it focuses on improving outcomes along the HIV care continuum, um, as well as bu building clinical capacity, um, and transforming clinical practices primarily through training and coaching. Eligibility requirements for practice transformation um, includes at least a minimum of six HRSA funded clinics, and those are three Ryan White or three non Ryan White clinics um, that are Section 330 funding. However, many of our ATCs are way above um, this, uh, the minimum of six HRSA funded health centers 
as they are conducting their practice transformation projects. Um, and this program also um, requires that at least 33% of the clinics must include replicable SPINS models or evidence-based informed interventions. So all of those um, initiatives that Adan went over earlier are very important for including both within um, practice transformation as well as within core training. Next slide. Practice transformation expansion is an expansion of our PT program. Um, it's an enhanced collaboration with our sister bureau, the Bureau of Primary Healthcare, focusing on increasing capacity of HIV providers in BIPIC funded health centers, um, those with a high prevalence of HIV or high incidence of HIV. And it's also focused within rural counties um, that have a high risk for substance use disorder. For the first um, year of this cycle of the regional AATC program, the AATCs that were funded were Southeast um, Pacific and Midwest. Next slide. So our national AATCs also play a vital role um, with collaboration with um, SPINs and for promoting our SPINs interventions and, um, and models. Um, they serve as the central repository for AATC training and capacity building resources. Um, as mentioned earlier, this is the website. Um, but more, most importantly, um, the NCRC also fosters collaboration and group facilitation among the ATCs as well as with external partners, external partners including our SPINS partners. And this is where um, communities of practice are able to be formed and um, lessons are learned, ideas are shared amongst the AATCs, um, and, and ideas, um, of course, can be shared as to how to continue to promote um, the SPINs interventions and models. Next slide. In addition to the National Coordinated Resource Center um, as an excellent resource for the AATC program, we also have the National Clinician Consultation Center that provides um, expert clinical consultation for healthcare professionals on HIV prevention, care, and treatment. And this slide lists all of the um, warm lines for clinical consultation as well as hotline um, that is done by the National um, Clinician Consultation Center through telephonic as well as e-consultation. Next slide. So the National HIV Curriculum was developed by the University of Washington and it's a free e-learning interactive website that provides up-to-date HIV training and information um, with self-study course modules. And um, we continue to um, work with the University of Washington in order to enhance and uh, maintain the national HIV curriculum. Next slide. In addition, the University of Washington works very closely with Howard University as well as the University of Illinois in order to expand the national HIV curriculum across um, the health professional programs. Next slide. And then April mentioned earlier um, a summary of the COVID-19 um, award, uh, awards that were provided for the ATC program, as well as we also have um, um, and in the HIV epidemic supplemental awards that were provided for the ATCs. And the um, total amounts are listed here. Um, in addition, the, um, and in the HIV um, epidemic supplemental awards are another avenue um, for continued um, collaboration with um, SPINs in order to um, um, promote the SPINs interventions and um, evidence-based um, interventions as work is being done within the EHE the, and in the HIV epidemic um, jurisdictions. Next slide. So as we continue to talk about collaboration between the ATCs and SPINS programs and we're looking at, um, we talk a lot about, um, about uh, Adon listed all of the in initiatives that were provided and have been um, developed by the SPINS program. And we talk about 
through the ATC program, we really want to continue to um, promote enhanced communication between the programs themselves. And we really want to hear from you how we can continue to do that, as well as ongoing promotion and dissemination of the evidence informed interventions. Um, we really want to look to providing the effective and, and useful tools across the HIV provider network to make sure that it's out there and it's really and truly at the fingertips of those who need it um, and sharing ideas and lessons learned. And that could be again through the communities of practice that we currently have or through any additional ideas that all of you may have. Next slide. So with that, I will turn it back over to Lori. Wonderful. Thank you so much, both Cheryl Lynn and Adan. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to roll right into a panel that talks about AETC and SPIN's collaboration. We're going to hold all questions until the end, so feel free to go ahead and post them as we go along. I'm going to introduce our two moderators in a moment, but I know that there's a uh, question in the chat about the slides. The slides for this session, as well as a one-page handout on the SPIN's AETC program, is posted Posted on the Target um, website, and Nicolay has en entered that information in the chat room. So go ahead, click on that link, download your um, materials, and you've got them all ready. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Anna and John, and just let me introduce these two players. So Anna Poker is a senior public health analyst in the AETC program. She serves as the project officer for the Southeast AETC. John Hane is our second moderator, and he's a public health analyst and project officer in the SPINS branch of HAB. And the SPINS projects in which he's been involved are the Digital and Social Media Initiative, Capacity Building assess Assistance to the Ryan White Jurisdictions, Opioid Systems Coordination, Housing and Employment Services, and Black MSM and Behavioral Health Initiatives. So Anna, I turn it over to you first. Thanks. Thank you, Lori. Um, I will introduce Ms. Jennifer Birch. She has a Master's of Education in Online Knowledge Management with a focus on adult learning principles and brings more than 25 years of adult education, project management, and training experience to the South ATC, Southeast ATC, where she has been a program director for the Southeast since 2015. Prior to that, Ms. Birch was a program manager for the Tennessee ATC, where she increased ATC training productivity by 50% and implemented cost-saving digital learning initiatives. I am also introducing Dr. Christopher Hurt, who is an associate professor of medicine at UNC Chapel Hill. He earned his MD from the University of Florida, trained in internal medicine at Brown University, and then completed his infectious disease training at UNC Chapel Hill. He has been a faculty member at UNC since 2010 and became the principal investigator director of the Southeast ATC partner, partner site in North Carolina in the summer of 2019. So Ms. Birch and Dr. Hurt will discuss the Southeast ATC SPINS initiative. So, Ms. Birch, would you like to kick it off? I can do that. Thank you, Anna. Thanks for having us today. It's good to see everybody. Uh, next year, we'll do this live, right? We'll do this in person. Uh, the, the Southeast AETC is out of Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. And we coordinate a monthly MAI, Minority AIDS Initiative, um, community of practice. And that's attended by all our um, state partners that receive MAI funding. So instead of um, only focusing on using those MAI funds for didactic presentations or interactive presentations or kind of working MAI topics into conferences or preceptorships, we really thought a, a great way to, to, to use our MAI funds would be to develop projects, online courses, toolkits, things that would really fill a greater need um, within our region. So in the last cycle, um, starting back in July 2019, um, HRSA requested a larger incorporation of SPINS projects into our work, and we decided one of the best places that we could do this was fold this into our MAI community practice each month. 
Um, so we asked partners to kind of research SPINs projects that would be helpful in their kind of regional work, but also um, in the regional projects. So I'll get back to that in a second, but we, we discussed the different SPINs projects um, within our community of practice. We went to the target site. We looked at some of the ones that were currently um, in production, a few things that had finished, and tried to figure out what was best um, for the southeast. And um, we really tried to look at um, how these would yeah, fit in with the southeast goals. So our, our partners are also asked um, to develop some type of regional project each year. Sometimes they take longer than a year. But um, the partners that were involved in our, our MAI community practice were trying to focus some of those projects on a, an MAI need. Um, so the, the projects usually play toward a strength at that partner site, an interest of the PI or an interest of a provider at that site, and they're really meant to help out partners across our, our whole region um, once they're complete, completed. Um, so for instance, one of the challenges that we face in the southeast is convincing providers that are in a correctional setting to attend our HIV education or change the way that they pro provide HIV care or consider providing PrEP or consider testing for HCV and, and trying to figure out ways that we can, can get these services built into a correctional setting. And we, we struggle with, with getting correctional providers to kind of reach out for, to us for capacity building or for technical assistance. But the North Carolina, our North Carolina partners at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, they don't have that problem. They, they've developed um, an excellent relationship with their correctional providers, and we thought, okay, we need to figure out how to take this relationship that they've developed and how to push this out across our region and, and try to get this work in many of our other states. But right now, North Carolina and, our, and South Carolina as well, both of those partners have a great setup, but um, some of our other partners would like to improve the relationships that they have. So um, Dr. Hurt, our awesome PI and, and director out of the North Carolina AETC, um, really worked with our community practice and used a, a SPINS project to kind of accomplish this task and work on rolling out a corrections toolkit that could be used across our region. So I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Hurt, and I'm going to thank him publicly for all his work and, and everything that he does for us. We, we appreciate you greatly. Uh, Dr. Hurt, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks so much, Jan. Uh, can, I hope everybody can hear me okay. And I'm, I'm just really appreciative of the opportunity to share the work that we've done here in North Carolina with you. Um, and so I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the backstory of how we um, got the project going. So um, uh, originally, um, we had uh, been contacted by Jane Fox from ABT Associates. So they had been working with um, different SPINS partners on a project to develop something called the Transitional Care Coordination Model that was um, geared towards improving linkages for people that were leaving correction settings, specifically with jails. Um, and in April 2019, uh, Jane and her team reached out to us um, to talk about the project and to make sure that we were aware that it had it was wrapping up. Um, just as a as a plug, you, you can hear more about that particular um, model. There are two sessions at this conference on that. So session 15029 tomorrow at uh, from at, starts at 1245 and session 15814 on Thursday that starts at 10 a.m. Both talk about the TCC or transitional care coordination model. And that's what we are, um, we selected as our um, um, foundation for the work that we were going to be doing. So we met with Jane. Um, we did it virtually before it was cool, before everybody else was doing it. Um, and uh, so that was in May of last year. Um, and, and I actually am embarrassed to say that, it, that we, I was not aware that this one of the three sites of the program was right in my backyard. So in Raleigh, um, in Wake County, where Raleigh is situated, was one of the sites for this particular project, along with Camden, New Jersey, and Las Vegas, Nevada. So um, we weren't quite sure at that moment what to do with that information, but it, we were really appreciative that they had reached out and, and tried to make that connection with the AETC to help um, get the word out about this project and to make sure that the, if there were partners that were interested that we could connect them. So um, we got our assignment um, from Jen's team at Vanderbilt from the Southeast AETC 
um, to as part of the MAI initiative for North Carolina to be working on corrections. So when we got that assignment, I thought, oh wait, maybe I can maybe I can use the spins toolkit um, that Jane told me about. Um, and so I um, I went back to Target HIV. And with my team at the AETC here in North Carolina, we went through the resources that were available on Target HIV um, to look at corrections packages um, and then made a decision to go ahead and use the TCC um, package as a starting point. The main driver for that was just how robust and comprehensive it really was. So um, down to the level of having um, uh, model versions for job postings for specific aspects of of hiring. So they really were very thoughtful and, and detailed about the types of resources that um, went into that package. So um, in the fall of last year, I met with my team at um, our state AETC, and we went through the TCC um, modules and um, really focused on two things when we were doing that evaluation. One was, um, what's missing? Is there anything missing? And what can we create and augment, rather than reinventing the wheel and creating all new materials, why don't we try to think about building something that's a wraparound um, that can augment this really excellent um, package that was already created. Um, and then we also were very mindful that the TCC project had focused on jails and that there are differences between jails and prison settings. Um, and so we wanted to be um, clear about what was different between jails and prisons and so we decided to, to talk to local experts that are attached to the different corrections um, work that North Carolina or that UNC has done um, in, in North Carolina. So we, um, the missing part was HIV 101 type content. And so what, and that was an easy fix for us because that's what our AETC and all of the AETCs really, um, that's our, our bread and butter is doing HIV 101 kind of general education. And we were trying to, to provide it both for um, healthcare workers that are engaged or may be engaged in HIV service delivery, but may not be familiar with it, but also for corrections officers and for the wardens and other um, uh, personnel um, and corrections uh, um, uh, settings. So that um, they, because they may not be aware beyond basic kind of bloodborne pathogen training that they get as part of um, their job requirements. So we really tried to look at it from both of those angles. Um, we invited external reviewers to look at the modules um, of the package. And then while those were underway, um, I went through and started creating the, the, um, the new educational focused content and then recruited my colleague in South Carolina, Dr. Divya Ahuja, um, to be our peer reviewer. So all of the new HIV education fo focused content, um, we ran through Dr. Ahuja as well, just to make sure that um, uh, it had gone through some level of peer review. At the start of this year, um, right when we got all of our key informant information and all of our reviews back, um, you guys know what happened. And so we've um, kind of uh, hit a little bit of a stall. Um, but we have a, a, a basically a, a final package right now that we're internally referring to as binder one and binder two. So binder one is the new content that we've created um, that includes that HIV 101 type educational material, but also some perspectives from um, our local experts, um, two of which were really important and very valuable. Um, uh, one was um, uh, um, a, an agency in Greensboro that had reached out and, and had pioneered a program with the jails um, in Guilford County um, and years ago. So um, that's Kathy Northcott um, with Piedmont Sickle Cell um, uh, Services. And so Kathy sat down with us and we had a very long, um, basically interview to talk about her experience. And then we put that together in sort of like a magazine interview type um, just, um, presentation. And then the second was with um, uh, my colleague here at UNC, Becky White, who is a physician that works within the North Carolina Department of Correction, um, specifically on HIV and infectious diseases care. So Becky was able to provide some context for what, what's it like if you're a program that's inheriting services from another agency. So we wanted to try to look at some different um, niche experiences and, and um, provide some kind of um, war stories, uh, for lack of a better term, and, and uh, tips and tricks 
that people can think about um, before they get going with their own individual projects. Um, so we're, we're um, um, kind of ready to go um, with our final draft and um, uh, uh, we just have to wait for, I think, for COVID to blow over in, in some degree. So um, I think that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hurd, and thank you, um, Ms. Burgin. Um, so to get a little bit off script, because you answered one of the questions that I'd planned to ask you, um, I just would like you, um, maybe Dr. Hurd or, or Jen, if you mind just clarifying, um, what is the challenge that, that there exists in HIV care as far as transitioning from correctional services, from prisons or jails, into the community, because I'm not sure if all staff fully um, realize that. So you may just want to give that kind of background a little bit. Um, yeah, if, sure. Yeah. And, th yeah. and thanks for that question. It's a, it's a really important question. I always just sort of assume that everybody knows. So, um, so thanks. Um, it's, it's a big challenge. So um, historically, um, I think um, it's been really clear that um, transitions back to the community are a weak link in the care continuum. So the main reasons historically have been that um, persons that are living with HIV who are experiencing incarceration, um, they may not be going back to the same community that they came from in a figurative and a literal sense. So often they're not going back to the same family that they were with. Um, they clearly don't have the same resources or support systems that they had before they entered jail or prison. So there's a lot of different factors that kind of conspire to make it more difficult to engage in care. And generally speaking, um, it's um, a kind of Maslow's hierarchy level of, of things. People are concerned about housing um, and food um, and, uh, and personal care, even as something that's as important as HIV care, may not be the top of the priority list. So providing some support for those individuals to help connect them to resources in the community and really make um, as seamless a transition as possible is the goal of both the TCC, but I think all of the programs that Spin SPINS has worked on in the past geared on corrections and, and improving linkages uh, for people that are um, uh, moving from a jail or prison setting back in, into the community. The other aspect really quickly is just that in prison, um, um, folks get healthcare as part of their prison experience. In jails, it's a very heterogeneous experience where some provide some level of, um, of visiting healthcare providers that may be able to offer some services in jail. Others don't at all. Um, and so it's a, sort of a patchwork. Um, and individual agencies and, and uh, clinics may have some sense of what that looks like for their own clients and their patients, but it is very different all, or, all around the country. I just got the notice that we've come to our time, but I really appreciate and thank you to Southeast. Um, and I will pass this on to John Hene. Yes, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. This is John Hene. I'm with the Special Projects of National Significance. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce three colleagues that I've gotten to know more recently. Uh, Dr. Allison Waridbo, who is an assistant professor of infectious diseases at UT Health San Antonio. Um, she is the, also the principal investigator on a hepatitis for, or curing hepatitis among people who, of color living with HIV. I got that all off, right? Straight. And, uh, and she's going to be joined by two of her colleagues, uh, Pedro Coronado, who is with Valley AIDS Council, one of the local sites for the South Central Texas AETC, and Rodel Bobadilla, who uh, is also with UT Health San Antonio, South Texas. And um, I'm, since we're running a behind schedule, I will let them take over and start talking from here. I think, Dr. Allison, we need to get you in first because I think you have another commitment to get on to. So uh, we'll start with her. Hi, thank you very much for having me today. Um, so our special project of national significance is to cure hepatitis C um, in people of color living with HIV. And we have kind of four broad goals um, across the project. And so our first goal is to integrate HIV care 
I'm sorry, HCV care, hepatitis C care into HIV care, and also into that integrate um, substance use disorder and mental health services. Our second goal is around education. And so for that goal, um, we did two things. We um, disseminated and evaluated the AETC um, HIV HCV curriculum. And we also started an HIV HCV co-infection um, ECHO program. So extension for community health care outcomes, which many of you may be familiar with. It's a tele-mentoring uh, model out of University of New Mexico. Um, and uh, UNM is also the South Central AETC um, head office now. And then our third goal um, was community um, education and engagement. And so prior to COVID, we had these annual um, community um, education and um, testing events. And then our fourth and final goal was to um, enhance um, surveillance. So hepatitis C surveillance in Texas, we only um, do surveillance for acute hepatitis C, not for chronic. And so we work very closely with Texas Department of State Health Services to enhance um, uh, hepatitis C surveillance in our state. And so it was really important that we, our partnership with AETC was, was very key. And at the beginning of our SPINS project, which started in at the end of 2017, we partnered with Valley AIDS Council in two capacities. So they were one of our clinical sites, but they are also uh, uh, um, AETC, the terminology has changed, it used to be called local performance site, I think they're now called local partner sites. Uh, and so we've worked very closely with them across all as the first three goals. So um, they've been great in um, education of our partners. Um, we've partnered with them um, in dissemination of our, the AETC HIV HCV curriculum, which I'll, I'll get um, Radell and and um, Pedro to talk more about. And then thirdly, they've been really critical partners in, in assisting us with our, our community engagement and our community events. So the, I'm kind of giving the overview and I will let um, Rodell and um, Pedro talk a little bit more. What has happened in 2020, which is a little bit different, is that um, UT Health San Antonio, uh, we became a, an AETC local performance site as well. And so working on this SPINS project now, a, a two, a, two AETC um, local performance sites, when the third year of our project, we will have a fourth year of a no cost extension. But that's, I'm just trying to give you all an overview. And so I will pass on to um, Pedro, at, um, who has the AETC at um, Valley AIDS Council, and um, Rodel Bobadilla is the AETC manager for UT Health San Antonio AETC. Thank you. So I don't know if Pedro, so I'll just go first. Um, so thanks, um, Dr. Allison. Um, so I'm the program manager at the UTL San Antonio South Central AETC. So um, as Dr. Allison mentioned, uh, we recently became local partner site in January 2020. Um, and this happened largely because of the collaboration between uh, the spin Sacco program and um, Valley AIDS Council AETC. Um, they recommended us to the regional office and they agreed. So we're excited to serve the South Central region of Texas moving forward. Um, our collaboration um, initially started with um, Tackle uh, from the beginning. Uh, they have a built um, clinical partner network site already that has a trusting relationship and it's been very successful moving forward. Um, we integrated ourselves within the HIV HCB um, ECHO, uh, co-infection ECHO, um, as a community practice um, program. Moving forward, I really wanted to build on it as an AETC site. So um, I think future future iteration of this ECHO is to build a more HIV component along with the HIV HCB co-infection component moving forward, build that network and also bring in new networks as it. So um, as far as sustainability and uh, building that program up as an ATC site, something we're looking forward to doing as well. Um, we're also developing an HIV HCB SUD um, uh, uh, symposium, half day symposium. Um, we usually have a national symposium that uh, uh, the VAC um, AETC usually um, hosts, but since COVID happened, um, it was 
um, it didn't happen this year. So we're really trying to uh, bring this to our region um, and our networks as well. So that's a collaboration between the SPINS Tackle Program um, and Valley AIDS Council as well. Um, and in that component, we're also going to be doing um, the uh, evaluation of the HIV HCB um, AC national curriculum um, with attendees there too. So there's an opportunity for further evaluation clinics as well. Um, and as an ATC site, I mean, we're the Ryan, we're the training arm of the Ryan White program. So uh, we really want to make sure we recognize the great work the SPINS Tackle program has achieved um, and try to build on that success by providing our resources uh, moving forward. Um, Pedro is going to give um, a good breakdown of how that was, how the um, evaluation of the HIV HCV co um, co curriculum um, was integrated within the, um, the national conference. Hi everyone. Hola a todos. Um, so yes, <laughs> thank you Rodel uh, for that. So when we, so this relationship has been great. I, you know, <laughs> I can't, you know, say anything, so many great things about working uh, with the UT team. Um, when we started working with them, Ideally, we started kind of like planning how we're going to be able to disseminate uh, these curriculums. Um, how, do we, how are we going to be able to engage people to, to participate? Um, so we already had some programs going on. We had our, our national uh, Latinx conference on HIV, uh, HCV, and SUD. Um, so we said, why not incorporate that in there? Uh, get uh, our UT partners um, involved in, in, in the planning process to uh, put together the conference agenda. Uh, we had a whole day just on HIV and Hep C co-infection, so we wanted to make sure that uh, they were all like, on the table to be, be able to make those decisions about what information we wanted to have out there, right? So um, when we have people uh, register for, for these conferences, they are given the, um, they are sent an, an email with a link to be able to look at the, at the, at the curriculum. Um, and we were able to get some feedback. So when we were planning for this call, um, Rodell was looking into uh, the response rate, right? So, you know, for the most part um, in the beginning, we had a, a pretty, uh, I think the first year we did pretty good with the response rate. Um, then we kind of wanted to get more uh, responses, right, for people to, to go over the curriculum. So um, we kind of started using some tangible reinforcements, right? So we were able to kind of, you know, do some, uh, some registrations and so forth for the conference. Um, so that kind of helped for the most part. Something that was really interesting, um, if anything, when, when Rodell shared that information, was that the, it was the screening module. Um, I think when, when it came to the screening module, uh, we were able to kind of see that um, in terms of like the knowledge prior to and maybe the knowledge gained, it, it wasn't that far off. And actually for every year that, that we saw this, right, it was almost the same. And, and it tended to be the one that was um, the, I guess, scored the least for the most part and the least uh, increase but there was an increase anyways in knowledge. Um, but it was just really interesting because it was the screening um, module that we saw there. Um, so I think when we, when we talk about the collaboration that we had with this SPINS project, um, I think it worked perfectly because you know, we're, we're gonna be a site, uh, a clinical site as well at the same time. Um, I think there's a lot of trust there, right? When, when you kind of already know an organization that you're going to be working with, um, you want to be able to build up on that trust um, and then just, uh, you know, and, and just be creative in, in, the, in the ways that we are able to disseminate this information. Um, I think that's kind of what really helped us out uh, to be successful in our programs. Rodell or Great. Allison. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was both very good, succinct. So um, we got a few minutes here before we need to get to the main uh, part of the discussion. Um, but any sort of lessons learned that you might want to tell both um, your AETC colleagues as well as uh, those of us in this room from the SPINS program? 
So I, I think that um, the SPINs, and this has been alluded to before, that the SPINs program in AETC are very co complementary, right? And, and they, they integrate very well together. Um, I think in the, in the course of our, um, our SPINs project and all the different tasks that we had to do around, um, around education and community engagement, it would have been a lot harder, not impossible, but a lot more difficult to do it without a partnership with AETC. Um, and I, uh, I think sometimes I'm an HIV provider, so I think um, sometimes HIV providers don't realize and not aware <laughs> of what a resource AETC is. I'm also a researcher, I'm a, I'm a physician scientist, so I think also the researcher in me, the researchers around in the HIV world are not aware of how you can um, integrate research questions into what you're doing um, within what the AETC is doing. And so that was how um, we very effectively, I think, um, developed a method to um, evaluate, to disseminate, not just disseminate, because we're like, we can disseminate the curriculum, but what would be really interesting was to, would be to find out how effective it is because we were disseminating it in the first year after it had been developed. And so, um, I, I think there's there's perhaps some some work that we can do in in letting people know, letting HIV researchers and HIV providers um, be really aware of of the resources that are available within the ATC in our region. Obviously, the ATC is all over the country, and every you know region is different. But for us, that's certainly true. If I may add on just really quick, and thank you, Dr. Allison uh, for that. And um, th there was another SPINS project that as, a, as an LPS that we also worked with uh, was Viendo Valiente. And I guess when they talk about, you know, really knowing uh, who those, uh, um, those SPINS projects are, who's running those SPINS projects, right? Uh, it's really important that you kind of have that, that uh, some, a good collaboration with them. Um, and I think uh, we, we learned that from also joining together with this other SPINS project that I think um, it really helped out because that project itself was working with the border community. We are an LPS right on the US-Mexican border. So um, I think it's really important to really know um, the sites that you're gonna be partnering up with. Sounds great. I'm gonna hand it back to Lori for the last part of our discussion up to the top of the hour. Lori? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much um, for all of the panelists. What we'd like to do now is open it up for a larger group discussion. And this was really intended to set the stage, both the information that was shared with Adon and Cheryl Lynn about the respective programs, and then really they begin teasing you in terms of opportunities for AETC and SPINS collaboration with the two examples that we included in here. And so we wanted to have an opportunity just to talk through a couple of questions, really doing this as a large group discussion and kind of thinking about where would we want to go. The first question that I want to pose to you and for you to consider is how can the AETCs and SPINs increase collaboration on those interventions, the SPINs interventions that are available? Think about what has worked in the past and what new ideas can be implemented. So those are the questions that, we're, um, that we want to ask right now. And uh, perhaps, Taria, I don't know if you could go ahead and uh, if you have that question to drop it into the chat room. If not, I'll just um, reiterate it here. But we're trying to get a sense of um, how can we get AETCs and SPINs to collaborate on these available interventions? What do you guys think? Feel free to put information down in the chat room. Take yourself off mute. I can't see people who are raising their hand because we have actually, I don't know if you've caught it, but we have 192 participants on the call at the very moment. So I can't see everybody. So feel free to take yourself off mute if you have a specific thought um, about this question. Hey, this is Jen Burge in the Southeast. Uh, just somebody give me a thumbs up if you can Hear me? I think I'm on mute. Okay, cool. Yep. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I would love to just suggest that this is possible. You know, we, we have these monthly director's calls, and if we could block out 
10 minutes on those calls to talk about a certain SPINS project. So whichever project is, is just completing or has completed and has some outcomes that are available to share, if, if we could just have a project presented each month, I think that might help us to be more aware of, of what's happening or what's completing or what was successful or what in ways that, that maybe someone who completed the SPINS project, maybe they saw, oh, if we had another year, we could have done this, this, and this, and maybe that's something that could be suggested to the AETC. So if there's just, just a small portion of that meeting could be dedicated to a spin stock each month, I think that would help us all to sort of stay in the loop. Because sometimes these things end and we don't really realize that they're, that they're done, or maybe we don't realize until a year later, and, and it would be great to just kind of continue that momentum if, it, if it's possible. So really having that standing agenda item, an opportunity where you can really dialogue about what is happening. So even if it doesn't take a lot of information or a lot of time is what I'm hearing. At least we have a place where we're checking in, getting an idea of kind of what's happening and everything. Love that idea. Thanks, Jen. Um, let me go to Deborah D'Alessandro De from um, the Mass is it Massachusetts Eighth Education and Training Center. Do you want to go ahead and take yourself off mute, Deborah, and talk a little bit about what you're talking about in respect to um, HCV elimination and what you've done uh, in terms of preceptorships? Hi. Yes. Um, so I'm with Mid Atlantic Eighth Education and Training Center. Mid Atlantic. Which MA is confusing in our name. And uh, the, in Philadelphia, we partnered with our uh, county health department to implement um, the goal of eliminating HCV among people with HIV, particularly in people of color. We developed a really excellent model built upon our HIV preceptorship model to, um, we uh, offered this training to all of our Ryan White funded providers in the EMA. So now all of our uh, part A funded providers have at least at least one person on staff who feels very competent to treat HCV. It's been very effective, but those preceptorships, you know, there's there's a, an amount of support that's needed that's that's challenging for us to include within the fairly prescribed funding we have for our core MAI and, and other activities. So I would say that when we find proven best practices, it would be great if there was some dedicated funding to continue implementing them. Excellent. Thanks, Deborah. So continued funding um, on those. Um, I'm going to go over now to Alicia from AIDS United. Alicia in the chat room had um, uh, in, uh, included some information about DEII. Um, Alicia, do you want to go ahead and take yourself off mute and tell us a little bit about what you've got going on here and what are some of the opportunities? Kind of what are you thinking about where we're going with this? Hey, Lori. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Um, so yes, yeah, so as Adon mentioned, uh, DEII was funded. We're in the last year uh, where we're really trying to promote these trainings. And what I did was I put in the chat room the four training um, interve interventions, ooh, training we're gonna do on the four interventions that we implemented over the last couple of years. Um, please reach out to me if you're interested in attending those trainings. The very first training is gonna be on patient navigation. And I think much to the example from the UNC um, presenter, similar work. We're training on these interventions so that potentially ATCs can work with their practice transformation clinics to implement these interventions. Again, my email is aiddowns at aidsunited.org. Shameless plug. <laughs> Well, thank you, Alicia. Um, you guys have a lot of materials that are coming out, so I think that that's a great opportunity to go ahead and take a look at what actually is being done to think about how do we really use this. So what else? And Taria, help me, because I see that the chat is, we're getting a lot of information that's going in there. Other questions, anybody, or comments that you want to go ahead and put out there as ideas and thoughts about how we work together? Hi, this is uh, Daria Bakker Lattimore from the Northeast Caribbean AETC. Those were great presentations. Thank you very much. I think I learned something from the presentations. Um, well, one, Jen, I think it was a great uh, best practice to integrate it into the MAI program, and I think that was that's wonderful. But the other thing I, I think I heard from both of those presentations was the involvement of the AETCs earlier on in the program. 
So it wasn't like at the conclusion and then trying to um, implement things, but having us involved in some way. Um, and I think Deborah also alluded to that too, that you know, with the additional funding. But the other point I wanted to, to bring up is, as we're working to bring these SPINS projects into our core and our um, PT sites, we're going through, as the presentation said, we're going through the modules, we're looking at them, trying to figure out what's the most applicable to that site given the goals that we're working on. Um, and so we're bringing that information to the PT sites and to the core training sites. And I'm wondering, is there also an outreach with the other parts, like the part A, B, and C, D <laughs> um, within HRSA to have the project officers there be aware of the SPINS projects so that it's not just, so they're hearing from it within saying, you know, this is a great thing for the part C's to be doing. Are you aware for this? And then maybe link up to your AETC to help you implement it. But to, so sort of like coming in from the background as well, um, having the part A, B, and C's be aware of these things being out there as well. It's a great point and really thinking about not just SPINs and AETCs, but how do we activate the rest of the SPINs um, project officers and the parts themselves so that there's um, awareness on their side. Let me pose that question to Don, um, any of my HAMP staff who are on the, uh, on the call with that. Thoughts or reactions, anything that is already being done or any ideas about how we could do this? Don, you're on mute. Yes, uh, that's a great idea. Uh, I mean, in uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, promote, promote SPINS interventions, uh, we do it uh, through the back end uh, by uh, being more proactive with our uh, 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 colleagues uh, you know, on the part A's, B's, C's, and, and, and D's. Uh, so that they can uh, help uh, uh, disseminate uh, what is relevant uh, in some of the geographical areas and, uh, and, and also link, link up with the ATC programs. Uh, I think that um, uh, we used to have a, a series of meetings in, uh, in our bureau uh, uh, regarding uh, 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 collaborative, some of project officers uh, for particular regions. But I think that we need to bring it back. Uh, we need to bring it back under under a new perspective, uh, uh, and and uh, and especially uh, on on development of uh, of lessons learned, you know, uh, so that uh, 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 can be put into uh, into training packages and manuals, uh, and where the ATCs uh, uh, are better better suited, you know, to uh, 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 to deploy these uh, uh, didactic materials, and. Uh, John, I know that you participate on some of those collab activities. Uh, you want to say something about those, John Hane? Yeah, uh, I was just going to say, yeah, we're very open to that. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the things I put in the chat box, we're trying to encourage early on when, particularly in our demonstration project initiatives, when sites receive awards that they reach out to and inform their local AETC, at least the partners, that, you know, they've received such and such an award. Uh, we're trying to include that in our language and the notice is a funding opportunity and that sort of thing. Um, I know, for instance, uh, let's see, Dario from the Northeast Caribbean, I know our colleagues at Gay Men's Health Crisis in New York have been in discussion with your staff about replicating some models that they've developed in the Housing and Employment Initiative. Um, and uh, you know, what we try to say to the sites is, the easiest place to start with replication is where you are. So reach out to others in your community, your planning councils, your AETCs, tell them your story, tell them the resources you developed, you know, invite them to become involved with you in replicating and spreading, you know, the intervention that has shown some improvement. That's what this is all about. And our main customers for SPINs are our colleagues in parts A, B, C, and D. Uh, that's why we do what we do. We're here to try to improve and change the system. Hey, John, this is right. So I just, um, uh, I, was, I put this actually in the chat, but what Adon said, um, Janine and I were actually uh, chatting around, this is an excellent opportunity, as Adon said, to kind of restart the uh, HAB, Ryan White HIV AIDS program cross parts meeting. Those are the meetings that Adon was talking about. And they kind of, they were kind of tabled for a while, but it, this is definitely 
um, some feedback that we'll take back to the Bureau to discuss internally further to um, not only restart them, but revamp them in a way to, to add that um, collaborative uh, piece uh, that we can get from all of these. So thank yeah, you. we do have quarterly cross part calls at the state yeah. level, but that right. isn't exactly the same, yeah. Right, and we need to start the others, yeah. Great. Great discussion, great ideas. It generated quite a few things. I'm actually going to go to um, Sarah Cook Raymond. Those of you who don't know her, she's with Impact Marketing and has um, had her hands in a lot of different projects. And as you see in the chat, she's kind of blowing it up. She's got so many ideas. So Sarah, let me take you off of mute um, for a moment. Come on in here. Share a little bit about um, your ideas and thoughts with us. And we can't hear you if you are talking. There you go. Oh, no, we still can't hear you. No, we still can't hear you. Ah. All right, let's see if we can um, work that out. In the meantime, um, Sarah, just uh, chat me when you think you've got your, um, your uh, audio um, unmuted. And let's um, keep the dialogue going. So what other ideas? We've talked a little bit about how we can um, collaborate on other interventions. Um, what type of, of uh, dissemination is needed to promote the interventions? What other ideas and thoughts do we have with this? And specifically think about our national AETC centers as well. Are there specific roles that you see um, those national centers playing that we haven't necessarily tapped into yet? Um, Wayne did uh, put a comment in the chat room uh, uh, further up in the chat that talks about with the workforce initiative, there was some preliminary discussions and some um, work uh, with the AETCs in a different way. What about the um, what about the question for the national centers themselves? Actually, Laura, any roles for that? Hi, this is Carol. Thank you for mentioning. I've been sort of trying to wait and just to put it out there. I think it's it's just really incredibly exciting, honestly, to hear about all the really innovative work that's coming out. And I think that's community informed. And I think, um, you know, our team at the NCCC would just be thrilled to play a supporting role, not only in like disseminating that to um, you know each region, but also across the country. I think you know we're in sort of this unique. Um, position to not only directly speak with clinicians, um, because I think they play a role in implementing um, these great ideas, but also because we can um, just really help uh, promote that, that, you know, national cross-regional dialogue. Um, and it's just exciting for us to, I think, be able to support and, and amplify everyone's voice and everyone's findings. Excellent. Thanks. Other ideas or thoughts? Lori, could I pipe up here? Sure. Um, I think one of the things, I mean, one of the lessons I think that came out of the practice transformation work, so SPINs and the AETCs both proceeded forward with practice transformation um, initiatives and movement and basically did so almost in parallel. SPINs may have been about six months ahead of the AETC in terms of the funding cycle that happened. But one of the issues there was the AETCs, you know, were proceeding with what they needed to do. We were proceeding with what we needed to to do in terms of spins and then you're trying to merge those at some point down the road and there wasn't really a sequencing that had it happening in one part of, of what would now be um, per, well I guess it's all hearses still right but it wasn't happening in one sort of unit and then could logically shift over it just didn't time in a way that made sense that way and I would think part of what needs to happen when thinking about this cross-part dialogue, particularly when it comes to some of the parts of Ryan White that are designed to help grantees or to push forward lessons learned, is how the different pieces are fitting together within HRSA so that things line up in a way that lessons logically tr translate across us 
before they're translating out to the parts A, B, C, and D, people who deliver the routine services. Great. Thanks, Wayne. And um, I know we are at almost the top of the hour. If we can go ahead and have um, the poll brought up. While uh, we're bringing that up, I just want to wrap this up. We've had a great opportunity to hear about kind of the expectations and the overview um, for those who started with us at the beginning of at 11 o'clock Eastern time about OPS and the overview. And then we were able to merge in and talk through opportunities for um, collaboration, great ideas about how do we do that internally? How do we create opportunities on a regular basis where we can talk about um, and showcase different ways in interaction, thinking through the interventions that are out there, getting the word out on the streets, both internally as well as externally, and also kind of thinking through some of the things that Wayne is talking about in terms of the um, a better synchronization. Um, so this is just the start of the dialogue. Um, as Taria had indicated in the chart, you are able to go ahead and download download and save your chat file. So I would recommend that you do that. Please complete the um, poll that we're, in, um, in, uh, uh, we're running right now. And I just want to turn it back over to April and um, Captain Willis-Smith to see if there are any final comments or um, uh, thoughts you'd like to share today. Thanks, Lori. I'll hand it over to Captain Willis-Marsh. Oh, thank you so much, Lori. Um, just in the essence of time, I just wanted to say uh, this has been a fantastic, my first business day meeting. Uh, the presentations have been really good. I've been also reading the chat. So all of the dialogue and conversations, suggestions and resources uh, are something that we definitely uh, will be taking a look at and the conversation around how can we continue this partnership and really uh, promote that good works that are going on is something that uh, we, we, we're already starting to brainstorm about it. So more to come on that. But thank you so much, everyone. This has been uh, just a fantastic meeting. Very informative. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and with that, we're going to go ahead and close. We know that we are kicking off the official Ryan White Conference shortly. So I'm sure we will be seeing you in different, uh, different sessions. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Lori. Bye, thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Lori, for facilitating. Bye, April. Bye, April. Bye. Bye, bye everyone. Bye, everyone.